Good afternoon, everyone. Um, excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the host government and the Club Madrid for inviting the MF uh, to participate in this uh, very interesting uh, uh, forum. Uh, I was thinking what to talk about uh, in this session is, is all about cooperation, regional economic cooperation. I thought I would uh, provide some of the uh, um, work that uh, the MF uh, staff has done to give you some sense how the world nowadays are interlinked. Um, there will be some charts and uh, figures that I want to show you just to underline the point that, that there are so many things we need to work together and without working together it's going to be very difficult to resolve some of the issues. Uh, and then I'll touch upon uh, some of the uh, longer this one, growth issues. So the, the way that I struck this uh, presentation is that I'm going to say a little bit about the current global situation and uh, how, that, how that might affect the uh, region. Um, since we're from the MF, we're supposed to watch this on a daily basis, so I'll share some of the observations we have. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the long-term growth. Uh, you know, having a short-term perspective is important, but we also need to focus on the long-term trajectory um, that we're heading to. Um, and then I'm going to say a little bit about uh, why uh, growth in the Pacific has slowed uh, over the past decade, which I'll show you that it ha we have indeed uh, slowed down over the past decade. And then I'll say a little bit in terms of the policy, what can we do to promote growth in the region. Now, this chart looks a bit uh, messy, but what basically says that the uh, global financial um, situation has become uh, increasingly tense again since a uh, uh, few months ago. Uh, what the charts, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the red and uh, uh, yellow line, and the, I think the, yeah, and the blue line are the three countries, um, uh, CDS, the credit default, default swap uh, spread. These are indications of the cost of insurance in the financial market. So the higher, like uh, you know, car insurance, the higher premium you pay, there's more risk, there's more uncertainty. And this, the higher the lines go, you know, it says the higher risk we're facing. The the uh, white line shows the volatility of uh, uh, financial markets, in this, this case, the stock market. You've seen both sets of uh, lines going up in recent months. So we're now in a, in a period of heightened global uncertainty and risks. And this gives you some sense uh, how this heightened global uncertainty affecting Asia and Pacific region. I'm using some of the large countries here because we have better data for them. It doesn't mean that they're not affecting Pacific Island countries, small countries. What you see on the left is uh, that uh, a lot of European banks um, and Euro area banks have uh, lent a lot of money to this part of the world. And um, that means if they face a, a you know, deteriorating situation at home, they might pull out some of their money out of the region. And that means we will face some financial difficulties in this part of the world. Uh, this just illustrates how we are linked, how closely, closely we are linked in terms of, of, of finance. And there's a, also um, a good news in this um, story, that you see most Asia Pacific countries have uh, more room uh, for, if you like, a, a, a policy response should global situation continue to deteriorate. The green area, you see that the countries that have lower public debt and higher public finance surplus or smaller deficit, the uh, reddish colors are the countries having high debt and higher fiscal deficit. So what this chart shows that the most or many of the Pacific and Asia Pacific countries 
have policy room to respond to a worsening situation. Now, the MF, uh, you know, as you know, does uh, global forecast regularly. We do it um, every six months and uh, at the sub-regional level even more often. This map shows the growth rate um, by color. Um, it's uh, self-explanatory. I, 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 um, I just skip uh, explaining to you. But this was done in April. Um, since then, the global situation has deteriorated quite a bit. Uh, we are now forecasting that the average growth for the region will be lower by at least a quarter of a percent now uh, than what we forecast in, uh, forecast in April. So clearly there's a deterioration in the, uh, uh, in the region in terms of growth outlook. Now what are the channels of um, you know, um, a spillover to this part of the world from global and regional um, situation? Uh, we will, I, I'm sure we mentioned a lot um, over the past two days about remittances. I'm just putting a few countries as like examples, Samoa, Tonga, and Tuvalu, and Fiji. These are the countries that are receiving a lot of remittances. For, for example, in Samoa, remittances are accounting 20% of their GDP, which is a lot. Tourism, of course, a lot of countries depend on. Trade flows, uh, we talked a lot. But there's also terms of trade, while commodity prices, food and fuel prices, back in this part of the world a lot. And finally, but not least, financial linkages. Um, I talked about the, the global financial market, both just broadly in terms of uh, Asia and, and the uh, Europe or the rest of the world. But remember, a lot of countries in the Pacific have trust funds, the wealth fund, that they accumulated over time either through mining activities or aid. And those funds are mostly invested in industrial countries. And if the global situation changed for the worse, they could be affected very badly. For example, Tuvalu, uh, sorry, uh, Kiribati lost quite a bit of uh, assets um, from the European crisis, or global financial crisis, rather, sorry. This just gives you a sense where we stand in terms of remittances. Uh, as you can see, that uh, for some countries we've seen a recovery, um, but for Others, the trend is still very weak. Uh, you see Tonga there has been suffering from a decline for quite a few years, and there's an underlying uh, structural problem. Uh, you know, as generations change, as uh, migrants don't send back as much money as they used to because their connections with um, families back uh, home country getting weaker and weaker. And but the overall story is that remittances have not fully recovered in most countries. Tourist arrivals. Um, here you see that Samoa has been sort of pretty flat over the past two to three years, where Fiji had a very strong growth after a currency devaluation in 2009. Vanuatu is not doing particularly well, but Palau is doing very well the difference between the, the, the ones that are doing well and those that are not doing well is largely because two factors. A is geography. Palau is very close to Asia, benefiting from large tourist arrivals from Taiwan, Japan, and Korea, whereas Vanuatu does not. The other difference is currency. Both Palau, Palau is US dollar as their currency. US dollar has been weak, so that makes it more competitive. Fiji has devalued, as I said, so attract a large number of tourists. Now, to sum up this sort of transmission mechanism, if you like, how the world, uh, world situation would affect this part of the world, we did some uh, sort of, a, if you call, uh, 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 statistical analysis. We came up with this graph, but forget, you know, the, the shape. It basically says that if if the Australian GDP growth is down by 1%, the GDP growth in this part of the world will be down by about 1% too. So we're almost one-to-one -one connected. So if the global situation deteriorates, affects Australia, say through China, when the Chinese economy is slowed down, demand for iron ore slow down in Australia, and Australia slow down, it will directly impact this part of the world. 
so much for the short run outlook, which uh, to say the least is very uncertain, and we have to be really mindful. And now turn to the longer term growth. You know, suppose we recovered from this current cyclical situation, the global downturn. Where are we heading to? Here I want to give you some sense what we um, have shown in, through our research. What the long-term growth trajectory look like for the Pacific Island countries? Here, there's a couple of points I want to make. We were hit hard by the global financial crisis, and even today, seven of the uh, 11 MF member countries. Uh, I only have data for MF countries, unfortunately. I don't have the broader uh, country statistics. Seven out of the 11 still their their GDP is still below the pre-crisis level. That is. After three years, we still haven't reached where we were before the crisis. And the growth in the past decade is the slowest for a long time. Right? We're falling, you can see that we're clearly falling behind other small states, other low-income countries. Of course, there's a large variation among Pacific Island countries. You see PNG and Solomon Islands have done very well, but most others have been having slow growth. And growth uh, in some, some cases, it has been volatile, but in general, uh, volatility has fallen somewhat. Now, we've done some work trying to say, to analyze, you know, just what determines you know, the growth rate in the Pacific, uh, especially if we benchmark against other small states. So here is the, um, the growth of other small states in per capita terms over the past uh, two to three decades. So on average, about 3% okay, each year. And what we found that Pacific Island countries does have a, if you like, a disadvantage because we're small, because we're remote. The cost of doing business is high. So that knocks off about 1%, 1 percentage point out of growth compared with other small states. So everything being equal, we tend to grow 1 percentage point less. Just because we're very remote, we're small. But we are at a little bit low income level, so there's a catch up. We can grow a bit faster. That gives us 0.4% uh, advantage every, um, over the period. The other big factor is that we tend to have a low investment. Right? That knock off about 0.4% from our growth. We have a little bit um, slower population growth, which work to our advantage, 0.2%. Uh, we receive large amount of aid. Now, aid helps living, increase living, living standards, but it does not necessarily help growth. So raise you know, our living standards substantially through education, through human development. But in terms of growth, this study shows that it doesn't increase growth. In fact, it reduces growth. Of course, I want to emphasize this is just a preliminary analysis, and we can do more work on that. We have a greater political stability, which helps us grow a bit faster. But our openness in terms of how much we export is lower. So for that reason, we grow by 0.5% uh, lower. So if you take into account all these up and downs, green and red, you know, some work uh, to our advantage, to our advantage, some are not, we end up this Pacific growth rate, which is about 0.7% a year per cap in per capita terms. So we, have, we, um, we grow certainly slower than other small states. We're not doing as well as we should have been. Now, I'll skip this eighth one. So why? we're not growing well, why we are openness is, is fallen. Uh, this just shows you that it's not because of global financial mm -hmm. crisis. You compare the uh, pre-crisis, uh, the, well, the, the decade from 1990 to 2000, and before the crisis and after the crisis, there has been a decline in openness. And the exchange rate might be a factor over this. Uh, I showed here what they call the real effective exchange rate for countries with the central banks there's a clear appreciation of the exchange rate, meaning we're losing some competitiveness over time because our inflation is higher or because we 
um, appreciate our exchange rate. These are the ones without central banks. Um, those using Australian dollars tend to have very large appreciation along with Australian dollars. Those using American dollars tend to have flat or, or, or devaluation. And Palau, as I mentioned, the tourism strength is partly because the weaker US dollar they use. Now, why do exports slow? Um, what do exports show? Well, we can look at this graph. It shows that Pacific Island countries' export growth tend to be slower, right? Especially during the last decade. And then, if you, show the, if you look at the destination, right, for PNG and Solomon Islands, export to China growing very rapidly. But for the, the rest, in fact, it's declining. Um, they are not taking advantage of the explosive Chinese market that is growing so rapidly. Um, if you look these other small states and low-income countries, you see their, their growth to China has been dramatic, and that helped them to grow faster. The other development, this is the international uh, um, transportation that has not helped the Pacific Island country in the past. There is a common presumption, assumption that you know, technology has bring down transport costs, so Pacific Island countries will have benefited. Yes, it did help Pacific Island countries uh, for several decades, but over the last decade or so, the commodity, uh, the food and fuel price increase, especially fuel price increase, in fact have increased the transportation costs to the disadvantage of Pacific Island countries. Airline transport costs, same story. So over the last decade or so, we're not benefiting uh, from the global technology uh, progress. Let me just uh, quickly wrap up the, this presentation. Um, I want to say a few words about short-run policy implications, how we should move forward, and then say a few words about the long-run policy measures we should take. We should rebuild policy buffers over time. Um, I didn't show you very much, um, but most countries have now very low interest rate. It means that there's very little room to further move down should you know, the global situation deteriorate. And we have used most of our policy room. There's not much we can use anymore, not, not much room we can maneuver. So over time, we have to rebuild that policy buffer, right? Both in terms of you know, getting more surplus in the, in the budget or less deficit, so that when the global situation deteriorates again, we can use the actual space we have to stimulate the economy. There may be for some countries have the possibility of using more flexible exchange rate to stimulate the growth. Um, I mentioned for tourism, that could be one potential. Fiji's tourism is a good example that after the evaluation in 2009, tourism grew, uh, grew by, um, by 17% in 2010. And this year, I think it's uh, another uh, around 10% or so. So it's astonishing growth after the evaluation. So we could use that tool. For the long-term policy um, measures, we need to think about structural policies, structural reform to increase our efficiency, increasing supply um, responses. Just having a competitive exchange rate that I talked just now wouldn't be enough. Uh, we need to increase efficiency and work through the supply side. We also need to support the private sector, encourage investment, exploit our comparative answer in resource-based industries like fisheries, tourism, agriculture, and so on. We also need to work on the trade policy. Um, two points here. We need to work on the broader regional integration, as we talked about, you know, integration with Australia, New Zealand, within MSG countries, and so on and so forth. But we perhaps also need to look further north, China, India, Asia in general, because that's where the growth is over the coming decade. Finally, we need to do something about transportation communication costs because, as I showed earlier, these are the killers for growth. They knock off 1% of our GDP growth. If we can work on that, mitigate that negative uh, effect, we can uh, you know, do something about the growth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation.